immediately went to Senator Leahy and his wife. His wife is actually a, a nurse, uh, so he was in good care uh, with her. Uh, but it's uh, something that 2021 doesn't need more of what we saw in 2020 in terms of uncertainty. Uh, so it's good to see that he was released from Walter Reed uh, only after a few hours of observations uh, there at the hospital. You know, and Kevin, I was also wondering as well, let's talk about impeachment a little a little more. Um, you know, a lot of Republicans are crying foul and saying this uh, is a conflict of interest because Senator Leahy will be acting as both judge and juror. Um, what do you think about that? Uh, is there precedent for that and impeachments of, uh, of, pa of the past? Uh, and is this kind of uh, just a talking point? Yeah, it's a good question. There is precedent in terms of uh, past impeachments not involving a current president. Uh, that either another judge in some capacity or uh, the president pro tem of the Senate has stepped in as that presiding officer. Uh, but as you saw today with Senator Leahy, he, uh, he took an oath uh, to uh, adjudicate this uh, in, with honesty and fairness and transparency. Uh, he's been in the United States Senate for 46 years. Uh, he has seen a lot over those 46 years. Uh, and I think the Democrats are in really good hands, especially now with this clean bell of health uh, coming out of the hospital uh, with Senator Leahy to provide over this uh, impeachment hearing. Looks like it's going to start either February 8th or 9th, uh, depending on uh, when the president's team uh, gets together uh, to represent him before the Senate. But all uh, indications are that we're moving full steam ahead now uh, with Senator Leahy and, and the presiding chair. Uh, and Kevin, I was also wondering, what did you make of uh, Rand Paul's effort today uh, to really put uh, senators on the record and say, do you or do you not think this impeachment should go forward? Uh, they, they took a vote today, a lot of Republicans uh, saying that, no, they don't think it should. What did you make of that? Yeah, Andrew, it's a great question. It's every indication that, that Donald Trump is still a really strong, uh, in a really strong position of power in terms of his hold on Republicans in the Congress. Uh, of course, I was uh, really uh, uh, delighted to see 10 members of Congress in the GOP conference come over uh, and support the impeachment uh, articles that were passed uh, just over 10 days ago. Um, and to see five Republican senators, now a lot of them are known for them you know, being moderates uh, in the United States Senate, senators like uh, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, but also fairly strict constitutionalists like Patrick, Lay or, uh, Patrick Toomey rather, of Pennsylvania and Ben Sass of Nebraska, cross party lines to side with the Democrats and vote that motion down. Uh, it'll be anyone's guess uh, whether we can build on those four or five senators as supporting articles of that singular article of impeachment going forward. Uh, and it's all up to those nine impeachment managers on the House Democratic side to really make the case to those senators uh, and to the American people. You know, Kevin, a lot of Republicans would say, even Democrats would say that uh, just it doesn't bode well uh, for conviction for former President Trump going forward because of all the Republican support for dismissing this impeachment. We he was hearing a little talk uh, amongst some senators. I think there were some reports tonight. Uh, you know, if this doesn't work, maybe a, a censure is in order instead. Um, you know, if that were to take place, don't you think it's uh, the Democrats are just trying to kind of kick this can down the road a little bit? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. And, and again, we'll see how the dynamics play out with how strong the Democrats' uh, case is with these House manage, uh, managers coming over to the Senate uh, in the next two weeks to present their case, uh, both to the to those senators and to the American people. But, you know, we saw one Republican senator break ranks, Mitt Romney, uh, in the last impeachment voting on one article. Uh, we saw five Republican senators uh, break ranks today to support uh, this impeachment going forward in terms of the trial component in the United States Senate. So as a Democrat, I'm seeing some cracks in the Republican uh, base uh, of support for this president. Uh, and again, it's anyone's guess now to see how strong the case will be made to those senators. If we can build on that, and if there are some Republican senators of conscience that cross party lines to, to uh, vote to convict uh, former President Trump. And Kevin, you know, this is a stream, so we have uh, all the time in the world, really. But I wanted to ask you as well, because there's this um, uh, Republican point now that a lot of senators are making that such an impeachment would be unconstitutional. You've heard, especially Senator Tom Cotton, the Republican from Arkansas, make this, uh, this um, argument and this claim that holding uh, a former elected official, no less a former president, on trial for impeachment is unconstitutional. Um, how can Democrats kind of, uh, you know, 
combat that talking point, it, it seems somewhat uh, somewhat valid because we are in unprecedented territory before, aren't we? Yeah, we really are. I mean, it's amazing to me to see the number of constitutional so-called experts uh, in Congress right now that come forward with those ideas in terms of what's constitutional and what's not. There's precedent in terms of a former member of a president's cabinet uh, being uh, impeached and tried in the Senate after he resigned, after he left office. So there is precedent for an executive level position. Uh, that was in the 1870s. But again, Andrew, to your point, and it's a really good one, we're going through unprecedented times, and we use that uh, term so much in the 2016 election, and of course now. We've never seen a president, uh, as the Democrats will, will prosecute, uh, inciting a mob to obstruct the operations of, a, of another branch of government to certify the election of his successor. That's unprecedented in just two weeks left in his term. Um, so again, a lot of dynamics will play out. Looking to history isn't really a guidepost for a lot of this because we've never seen anything like this, the sacking of our capital by our own citizens. And obviously everyone will be watching, Kevin, what uh, now Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell will be doing because he's made a lot of public statements, uh, but we don't really know which way uh, he will come down on this. It would be quite stunning for a member of the president's own party, no less uh, the former majority leader, uh, to vote to convict. So we'll be watching that here on News Now for Fox. But since I have you here, uh, why don't we just transition a little bit the conversation and talk about what's going on with the filibuster? Can you kind of walk our viewers through, you know, what is the filibuster used for? Uh, what do they want? What do Democrats now that they're in the majority either want to do with it or get rid of it? Some of people are talking about there's a sharing arrangement that McConnell and Schumer have come to an agreement. Can you kind of break all of that down for us for, you know, you used to work in the Senate, but a lot of these rules can be quite arcane. They are, and it's a really good question, and there's a lot of confusion about what the filibuster actually is. And, and it actually comes from the word Greek to really hold the floor. Um, and it was something in the rules of the Senate, it's not in the Constitution, it's not in any law that was passed, but it's been a governing principle of the Senate operations for the last 200 plus years. And it's the idea that a singular, singular senator can take to the floor and speak uh, uh, for as long as they can to obstruct the operations of that Senate moving forward. And what you would need is to have 60 votes to call into question what is known as culture, culture, excuse me, to force the vote to end that discussion on that particular uh, uh, piece of legislation and to move the vote forward. So uh, interestingly enough, we saw the most uh, prescient uh, use of uh, the filibuster was in the 1950s and 60s to obstruct civil rights legislation when Southern senators uh, took to the floor actually to obstruct uh, the Senate from moving forward on the civil rights bill, on the voting rights bill. Uh, now uh, we don't force senators that often to actually take to the floor. Uh, we just uh, assume that uh, they will hold that body up uh, unless we get that 60 uh, vote margin. You'll remember Andrew back in the fights for the Affordable Care Act uh, when we lost Teddy Kennedy, he was the 60th vote uh, for health care. Of course, he was uh, replaced by Republican Scott Brown, and, and he campaigned on the idea of being that 60th vote. Uh, and it's the idea that the minority in the upper chamber should have some rights to dictate the, the legislative path. So Democrats have been hot to do this uh, for a long time because they see uh, kind of the tyranny of the minority in the upper chamber of the Senate uh, and are eager to pass a legislation to I support kind of the left flank of my party when it comes to climate, when it comes to economic policy, uh, when it comes to criminal justice reform, something that you're not going to see a lot of Republican support for. We saw uh, the filibuster end for certain appointments, especially judicial appointments. That was a hallmark of the Senate operations uh, back over the last hundred years. Democrats actually changed the rules. Uh, to get a number of justice, justices and judges appointed and uh, regular appointments during the Obama years. Mitch McConnell, who is a really legislative master, I, I give him a lot of credit even as a Democrat here, uh, used that effectively to pass a number of judges and judges, judges to the federal level, including three Supreme Court justices uh, to the federal bench. Uh, so you're going to see Democrats wanting, I think, to move forward with ending the filibuster, where it's just plain majority rule, which is what we see in the House of Representatives. President Trump is impeached on a baseline 50 plus one vote uh, in, in the House of Representatives. 
they want to see the upper chamber also move in that direction, some members of the party. There's also a few holdouts that don't want to see that happen. There are more moderate members of the Democratic caucus in the Senate. All right, Kevin Walling there, uh, live for us in hopefully Washington, D.C. Thanks for breaking that, that, that down that for history us. history of the Senate. I said, hopefully I didn't put anyone to sleep with the history of the filibuster there watching the program. <laughs> no, no, not, not quite, Kevin. Uh, um, <laughs> but yes, we'll be seeing all this play out um, once the Biden administration agenda items are put uh, to the Senate, uh, COVID relief uh, being one of them. So we'll see how all of this plays out uh, as we go forward in the week. Kevin, thank you so much for being with us. We'll see you again. Good to be with you, Andrew. Thank you. All right, so really interesting discussion on everything happening in Capitol Hill at the moment because uh, we've heard that word a lot, unprecedented. There's another impeachment trial uh, in just a year's time. Remember, uh, I was back there 